It's uh, John Quelch here, Dean of the University of Miami Herbert Business School, and welcome to this evening's Southern Glazers Distinguished Leaders Lecture Series, uh, our event this evening with Brian Moynihan, Chairman of the Board and Chief Executive Officer of Bank of America. Uh, I want to thank uh, Bank of America in particular for uh, all of their work on behalf of our university at Miami. And I believe we have many uh, of uh, the 20,000 or so Bank of America employees in Florida uh, on the call with us uh, this evening, including two people who I uh, said I'd give a special shout out to at the Coconut Grove branch. Jessica Alvarez, who's the manager, and uh, Christian Carlin. So a special welcome to Jessica and Christian. Uh, joining me on this evening's uh, conversation with uh, Brian is uh, our alumna and board of trustee member, uh, Courtney Gibson. Uh, Courtney uh, is a graduate of uh, the Miami Herbert Business School. Uh, she's a longstanding uh, employee and now president of Loop Capital Markets in uh, Chicago. And uh, as I said, she's a trustee of our university as well. Uh, so I'll be sharing the, uh, the, the hosting responsibilities this evening uh, with uh, Courtney. Um, we're really delighted to have uh, Brian with us. And uh, without further ado, I'm gonna, gonna start uh, Brian by asking you um, just a very simple question. How did you come to be in banking in the first place? Well, John, thank you. It's a great to be here with our great client, the, the U, the University of Miami, and, uh, and thanks, Courtney, for joining us tonight. And it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I'm glad you recognize our teammates in the branch because you know, what people uh, may not realize is we've had our branches open during this whole pandemic crisis. And those teammates on the front line have done a great job of serving America and helping America function. But uh, how did I get into banking? Um, I was a lawyer. I grew up and always was going to be a lawyer. And then I became a corporate lawyer, which is probably not what I thought I was going to be. I thought I was going to be a criminal lawyer like everybody else that grew up in the days of Perry Mason being on TV and F. Lee Bailey writing <laughs> books and things. And so I started practicing law and along after I became a young partner, of, I did a transaction called the Bank of New England transaction with a company called Fleet bought the Bank of New England. And I, I, I helped get that transaction done for our client. But I, in the end, we'd structured a very unique structure that had a dual convertible preferred stock, which won't mean a lot to a lot of people, but was a very unique instrument that we'd figured out how to do. And a fellow named Terry Murray ran the company uh, told the general counsel, he said, get, get that guy in here. And he said to the general counsel, he's too smart to be a lawyer, which I'm not sure what that, the general counsel ever took that too well. Uh, but Bill Mutterpro was general counsel, a great client. I went in and within a short period of time, they moved me into business and, and sort of the rest became history. But I grew up really as a, as a person, my grandfather was a lawyer and I always thought I wanted to be a lawyer. Ironically, my grand, other grandfather who passed away when I was, just before I was born, was a banker and we own that bank today. Um, it's a, in Batavia, New York, where my parents grew up. So we actually own the bank and I have the, the quill pen where we kept the books, you know, the old fashioned fountain pen uh -huh. and, and my father gave it to me. So I've got a history of banking, but I never thought I'd be one. So over, over the course of a, a 30 year journey in, in banking, um, a couple of pivotal moments that you recall, uh, maybe a role model here or there who uh, mentored you along the way. Well, you know, the questions like that make me feel old. So I, I, I guess, John, uh, look, but looking back, you know, the, I, I start off initially, they had me do strategy and M&A as a principal buying the companies. And I learned a lot from the colleagues that worked uh, with me on that uh, because I was a lawyer. I, I hadn't had math since high school, honestly. So I went to Brown and they didn't have requirements. So it was, you didn't have to go through the normal distribution requirements. And so they taught me a lot about business analytics and stuff. The 25 MBAs that were working for me beat the crap out of me right from the start. And then along the way, I learned a lot from Terry Murray, who taught me about how to drive business. I learned a fellow named Chad Gifford ran the company, and I learned a lot from him about how to be, how to balance the customer, you know, really think about the multiple stakeholders, the customer, and really become customer focused. And Chad gave me my first real business opportunity running the wealth management business at that company. It was called Fleet Boston at the time. And then 
Then I went to work for Ken Lewis and I learned a lot from him about scale. When you came into Bank of America, you know, I was running its smallest division, but I think I had 30,000 plus teammates at the time. So you had to think about everything from scale. And so you learn the pivotal moments was always you know, never turn down an assignment, never say you couldn't do anything. I had some interesting sidelights in there where I almost was out of a job in one of the mergers and other things like that. But you just had to keep being resilient and keep thinking about what was what the company needed to do and then do it and do a good job and then your major career. But each of those CEOs, I learned some different techniques from in terms of how to run companies and somehow that all boiled up inside me and the management team. And now we know how, I think we know how to run a pretty good company on big scale that uh, is very customer centric and very balanced. And let, let's fast forward to uh, 2008 uh, or thereabouts. And there's uh, a very famous story of uh, you and uh, Warren Buffett having a conversation. Could you please share that with us? Well, that actually took place in 11. So, you know, in, eight, uh, in 11, sorry, yeah. the crisis hit. And, and then what happened is we bought a bunch of companies uh, from 2000, uh, or from uh, 2003 to 2009. In six years, basically, we did four or five, five or six large transactions. 150, 200,000 people came in the company. We only have 200,000 now. So think about all the change, Countrywide, Merrill Lynch, U.S. Trust, Fleet Boston, uh, LaSalle. You know, these were company after company after company. And then we have 20% market share in mortgages and the world hits the fan. And, and, and so we have a big investment banking area. We have a big mortgage area. We, so we found our way, a big credit card company through MBA. All that came to fruition. So we made it through and we were working our way out. And then come 2011, the, the regulators, and rightfully so, started raising the capital requirements. And there was great debate about you know, the lawsuits and the mortgage servicing costs and stuff. And so we were kind of bandied about. And by the way, people don't remember this, but the federal government you know, shut down, ran out of money, and, and was close to defaulting on its obligations because there's a fight going on about funding uh, in, in between Congress. And we think this has happened many times, but it hasn't happened that often. It was a real dogfight in August of 11. And so I remember the treasury needing money to pay social security <clears throat> costs and stuff. And we had to decide whether we we're going to front it to them and things. It was kind of interesting. And lo and behold, our stock was banging around and people said we needed capital, et cetera. And on a Monday morning, I got a call in from uh, Mr. Buffett and said, Brian, you know, I, I looked, I thought about it over the weekend. He later said he was in his bathtub with the idea, but I'll let him confirm that. That's not uh, my uh, thing. He had the idea. He said, I want to put $5 billion in your company, and this is the way you want to do it. And I said, uh, Mr. Buffett, it's an honor to talk to you, but we don't need the capital because we had enough capital. It was just stability. He goes, I know you don't need the capital, That's, or else I wouldn't be calling you. What you need is stability. And our stock was about 6 bucks a share at that day, and he invested at $7 a share, actually, as a premium. And the next morning, we signed a deal. So he literally called around 10 or 11 o'clock, and by the 8 o'clock the next morning, we were done, $5 billion of capital. The company stabilized and they're off. Therefore, we took off. And the key thing was that next day, 200,000 plus teammates knew that the smartest investor in the world had said, this company is a really good company. And that just energized us all. And we took off and, and he's done well since then. Subsequent to that, he's actually put more capital in and bought more shares. And he's been a great supporter of our company. And we thank him for that. So, so looking at a comparison, perhaps, between the... Uh, the crisis of uh, 08 and its aftermath and the, uh, the current scenario that we're facing. Can you draw some contrasts? Uh, what's similar and what's different? This current crisis is a healthcare crisis. And so, you know, at the end of the day, you have a, a, a virus, the COVID-19 virus, it's a healthcare crisis. It, it's a, and the whole world, world is at war against this virus. And guess what? We're all on the same side. It's, I mean, it's a world war against the virus, race for vaccine, ushering massive amounts of uh, uh, pp and &E and and hospital capacity and all those things. But it's the whole war, the whole world is on the same side, which is unique. And that's the difference. This is a, you know, there wasn't, when you go back and look at 08, there was a lot of over leverage in the system in a lot of different ways. There were, you know, the, the uh, complex securities, there was a lack of capital, there was a lack of uh, match duration liquidity not to get too technical. And so the bank, you know, over leveraged at the, at the enterprise level, over leveraged at the household level, you know, the housing had just run up in value and people were speculating in it like no tomorrow. Uh, and so all that came to fruition. And, but the big difference was this is a crisis caused by a virus. So everybody was on the same side saying, 
banking system, we needed to help. So we'll we'll provide, you know, the Fed came in with a massive liquidity facilities and a, and a massive stimulus because it was no one's fault. That, that created a much different tone is number one. Number two, the banking system was in terrific shape. And so, you know, we had probably 3% tangible common equity ratio back there just to get people a sense of difference. Now, going into this crisis, I think we had seven or so. Well, that doesn't sound a lot, but that's two, two times plus. And that's just a tremendous amount more capital, huge amount of liquidity. And during this time frame, our capital ratios have gone up. We've had more liquidity. We put up reserves. We've helped 2 million customers defer their payments. We've waived millions of dollars of fees. We did 350,000 PPP loans. We absorbed $70 billion of loans for clients who took them to capital markets, ultimately 300 billion of deposits. So our in company and our industry, quite frankly, was a source of strength. And it was because of capital liquidity and, and the rules and regulations. And frankly, to give credit to my colleagues uh, in, in our company and around the other companies, the management teams have run these companies well. And that means that we just aren't the problem. That's a different atmosphere. But you know, then there's similarities. Unemployment's up and you have to think about stress and stress tests, vol trading volumes and volatility went way out. And you know, so there are similarities, but you, you can't forget that having a strong banking system, having a government that was resolute to fix it and not because there was no one to blame other than you know, the virus itself, just changed the tone of this thing. And, and the Fed did a great job and the administration and Congress did a great job of stimulus, CARES Act, et cetera monetary stimulus, world ba banks around the world, central banks around the world, it was just much different. And can you, can you talk to us a little bit about uh, uh, the way in which you and uh, your leadership team and the board responded, when you responded, in what order you responded to the various elements of, uh, of uh, change that this uh, crisis imposed on you? Well, the, so a couple of things, number one, we had a window to this because we have operations in, in, in China and Hong Kong, and you saw the impact of the virus and some of the shutdowns. There was also, people forget, there were protests going on, so there was a lot of stuff going on. It, it, so you had a window to this thing, but it was really in early March when, when the United States closed its uh, travel from Europe in, and there was a realization that this thing was going to be different, that we had to change operations. And, and so you have to have a set of principles which you go after a problem, and our principles are we have a set of principles called responsible growth, but, but the way we applied them here is we went after it on a, a teammate-centric, customer-centric, community-centric, and then ultimately a shareholder-centric view. But the real question was we had to get our teammates safe. So we said, how do we get them safe and how do we get them in position to work for the customers? So what that mean? 180,000 teammates moved to work from home, a, a, a massive amount of PPE-type activities, uh, mask, barriers, gloves, cleaning, deployed at the branches. Uh, a benefit structure had to change dramatically. One of the things we did, which was right out of the box, was we gave, we provided a benefit for $100 a day to anybody who had kids that they could hire somebody to take care of their kids in their home so they could work. Hmm. We had a million seven of those days taken by our, our teammates, and, and that allowed a stability and a calmness in the house. We then said to the employees, there'll be no layoffs this year. And that was to make sure everybody, knew, I have a job. I can then do my job because I've got the child care support. We have 40,000 teammates that have kids. They have 80,000 kids. And those households were just, you, people think it's confusing now. Remember when those kids were coming flying out of school and landing at home and people didn't know how this was transmitted and there was fear. The last thing it needed was employees worrying about that and then trying to be a hall monitor, an IT instructor, uh, a, a, a classroom tutor, and, a, and a, a lunch, make lunches and work. So we try to take care of that. And so we try to lower the stress in the household, huge mental health resources deployed, unlimited visits, uh, Teladoc and Teladoc did a great job for us. So those were sort of benefits that was employee centric. And then we did extra pay and, and we did all those things just to really say to the employees, get the high risk people off the line, be safe. We're gonna enable you to work. We're not gonna worry about you can't do a job because you're doing a different job or retrain you over time. And in fact, we did that. And then the second thing is a customer center came up. We said to customers, you don't have to pay us. You can defer 2 million customers, deferred payments. That's down to 100,000 now. So largely that's, that's gone away. We did the PPP program. We did the $1,200 payment program called EIP. We helped with the unemployment distributions. Uh, we helped you know, with just the sheer demand of, of programs came on uh, through the capital market support. We helped it so that we had to help our customers. And then we did it in all different uh, uh, walks of life, uh, walks of different types of customers, including wealthy customers, lots of advice. 
And then the last thing is we had to do a community center. So we did $100 million additional charity right out of the box. We put $250 million more on top of the $1.5 billion we had in CFIs to help stabilize lending in local markets. And then we subsequently, when the next crisis came at the same time, which was the you know, racial social justice after the, uh, the George Floyd killing, and, and we just had another crisis, we did a billion dollar program, which we can talk about. But in a real outset, the community side was $100 million and the $250 million, and really stepping up our charity. We gave away masks, 5 million masks originally. Now we're up to about 15 to 20 million masks to schools and others that can't afford it. And we just said, how can we help and how can we drive it? And then all that meant we could take care of the shareholder because the customers stayed loyal. We, sure. We've added customers. We've added employee scores have gone up. Customer scores have gone up. And we've made, you know, for the worst financial crisis in a long time in America, you know, we've made $13 billion after tax. So we've performed okay. It's solid in the, given the context. <clears throat> What, what was the most difficult decision uh, during this period, the last six months? We, we had to have the courage to, to get the people off the line at a high risk. It wasn't difficult to make, but it, it, it ended up being 20, 25,000 people that you were going to move before you had any ability for them to do their job. Okay. The second, and it, these aren't difficult decisions, the second tactically difficult decision was to get 100,000 computers deployed in four weeks, including screens and stuff, and get people enabled on them at home. And you, know, you might expect that we had a few calls between our suppliers of computers about how they weren't keeping up their promises to get them in the country or get them uh, in, in our employees' hands fast enough. So that was kind of interesting. Um, but th those weren't difficult decisions. Once you had a set of principles, you made them. It was, you know, the scary thing was, could you, could you handle record volumes at home in, in, a, in a way that you've never had to do it? So if a hurricane, which I hope doesn't happen, hits you know, Jacksonville and our call centers there were shut down, you know, they'd be disrupted for a week or so, but we just take the volume and have it go you know, to Maryland or California. This, everybody had to leave immediately. It's very different. And you know, so I think the prescient decision we made was to get the high risk teammates off the line and, and get people home. But that had some risk attached because operationally you had to, de you were deploying computers to people who had never had a personal computer because their job never required them to have. And right. it was really, it was pretty wild. Now, Kathy Basant, our head of tech and ops, did a great job along with the teammates. And by the way, our teammates did a great job to learn the technology, learn new jobs. It was, it's, it was pretty remarkable. Most, most people would say that uh, uh, the uh, effect of the virus has been to accelerate trends that were already underway. Uh, I wonder whether or not that's true in uh, banking or at Bank of America, particularly, for example, in terms of uh, retail branches versus uh, online delivery of services. Yeah, I think, so what, what did we notice? Um, the idea of people using our mobile banking or digital banking platform was not new. We have almost 40 million customers that use 39.6 or something like that right now, two and a half billion digital logins on the consumer side in, in the third quarter alone. Um, but what you saw is it moved to cohorts that had not used it So as, at the rate. So 20% of all the new people who deposit a check using the mobile app were seniors or, or boomers. So you saw those cohorts adopt. It wasn't that the millennials are changing, they were already there. And so that, that had an implication. Yet we still had, you know, I think at the low point on a given day, we probably had 200,000 uh, people come into branches. And we're probably back up to three to 400,000 coming in every day on a routine basis. So you needed high touch, high tech. So did it accelerate some trends? Sure, but we'll follow the customer as we have been. We had 6,100 branches at one point. We have 4,300 today and we're in new cities. And so there's a constant ref reforming and replacement of that branch structure and moving around based on customer behavior. <laughs> I'd say that what's more interesting was the impact on the ability to communicate. So our, our, our relationship managers are doing twice the contacts in the private bank, for example, than they did before the crisis because they, they spent a, a lot of time going to places and traveling in cars and, and suddenly nobody could do that and clients were welcoming the advice and the contact. So suddenly the contact rate went up tw two times. The question is how that levels out when people are thirsting for human interaction and it'll swing back a little bit, but a commercial banker, same thing. We're doing one and a half to two times the connections with clients, largely because the clients needed information and there was no way to do it physically. So you didn't have the, uh, you know, the hour drive between clients and the right. types, none of that happened. So it was really a different element. We did record amounts of, you know, fixed income debt issuance 
you know, with our investment bankers, when none of them could go visit a client. And right. so the, the long-term implications of the client acceptance of, of how they engage with you, the long-term implications of the clients attending uh, uh, you know, events like this, how, how, long, how long would it take me to have gotten scheduled with you and gotten it all to work to be sure. physically at your wonderful campus and we'll come see you as soon as we can. But that would have taken a long time. We were able to put it on the schedule more quickly. So that convenience of connectivity uh, won't replace human interaction, but it'll change the nature of, of the pace of interaction. And that's kind of interesting to us. Um, and then we found a lot about backups and, and resiliency. It, it, we would have never thought that you could have had, you know, those call centers in my example before work from home. And now you're saying, wait a second, we can have a resiliency plan that's different because you can spread people out more quickly if you had fires, if, if like we have in California now, if you have hurricanes like they're coming up in the, in the Gulf Coast now, if you have earthquakes like we've had they have in places, if you have monsoons, like it, it, we have all our teammates in India are working from home, which we never would have thought of as an, a possibility. So it's taught us a lot about resilience. So it's going to affect our operations in every way. I think people may overstate how fast because humans are humans. And you know, every day we still spit out 200, $300 million out of the ATMs in cash. So as much as people are everybody cashless, there's $300 million going out by the time we, this time tomorrow. So people are still getting a lot of 20s and 10s and 100s and 50s out of the ATM. So don't, don't, don't forget that you know, habits don't change as fast as people say, but we have to watch them and move with the customer. Great. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Courtney, um, but uh, just remind our uh, attendees, please uh, send in uh, any questions on the Q&A function, and we'll get to those a little bit later. Courtney? Absolutely, Brian. It's such a pleasure to chat with you today. It's so interesting um, when you think about our business and how it's morphed over, you know, over time. And I don't think there's been a time in history that we've seen the level of creativity and innovation that we've seen probably in the last eight months. Um, you know, I want to kind of piggyback on what John was talking about as it relates to the retail branches, right? What do you think actually happens to those as we look forward? And I know it's a delicate question, but how do you expect it to morph and shift as we move forward? Well, what has been happening uh, really uh, over a long period of time? Actually, there's a fellow named Walter Massey that's in Chicago, of course, you may know that uh, is a great leader. He was the chairman of Bank of America um, when, when I first became CEO. And so Walter, uh, he's also Professor Brown, is at Brown, so he's, we followed each other around a little bit. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but Walter wrote a book, and, and in there, there was a fact, and I, I said, this can't be right, but I wasn't with a company then because it was, it was still with Fleet at the time. And, and the fact was in 1999, when Bank of America from San Francisco and Nations Bank in Charlotte came together, he said there were 4,800 branches, and I should never doubt uh, Walter's attention to detail, but I said, that can't be right. So I had somebody go check it because I didn't want to make a mistake. In the book, I was reading a, a proof of it. And, and, and it was true. And we had 500 billion in total assets when those two big companies came together. Well, since then we've gone from 500 billion to 2.7 trillion right. and we only have 4,300 branches. Right. So this trend has been going on for years. And so what are the branches now? They're less transactions and more relationship management. Um, People use their mobile device to set, you know, a half million or something like that uh, of uh, uh, appointments at the branches to, to do things. Because in the end of the day, the complexity of financial matters to people requires face-to-face -face interaction and a, and a human being and someone to talk to. So it's a high touch, high tech, as we call it. But what's happened is our branches are further apart because people are willing to drive for that kind of interaction as opposed to I come out of work and I want to deposit my check. They're willing to move. The ATMs have atomized cash, so it's available everywhere. So you don't have to go into a branch to get even fairly sizable amounts of cash. Um, and then the digital presence allows you to connect for other questions you might have in routine service. So what you're seeing is a massive change in terms of what goes on in branches. So they're much more relationship. They're either bigger or smaller. Bigger in that they have a lot of uh, people who can do mortgage loans and uh, Merrill Edge and, um, and uh, home equity loans and credit cards and all the different products and services and they'll have seven of those and two what you call tellers in the traditional relationship management call them now you know they completely flipped and and it used to be you know seven if you go into our big branch now we moved to a new building in chicago we won't be there but if you go in that big branch in chicago that you're you probably have walked into in your life and it had just this row of tellers 
that was probably 30. Those were the days when everybody came in and deposited their money and got it out, cash their checks and everything. Those days are gone. So it's been a massive change. It will continue to change. So our expectation is we've entered new cities. Um, we've got to have physical plant in those cities. It's worked out wonderfully for us. Um, we keep refining in the cities we're in and the branches will be bigger. And then we have things like advanced branches, which are totally automated. We have, you know, which a person can walk in and conduct their business. Even if they want to talk to a person, that person's in, a, in Jacksonville, it happens to be uh, talking to them through video screens. The, the use of this type of act, interaction is make us thinking more about people probably have a higher um, desire to do that than they might have had before. You're kind of convinced them to do it. Now they're saying, I've done this for everything else. Sure, I'll talk to somebody. By the, by the way, they can do that on their phone. So why do they need to even go to a physical plant? Well, the T1 connectivity and the pace and the privacy and all those things. So the branches will be there. They're just con constantly configuring to, to be different things. So the bigger ones were real destinations, smaller ones, more distributed to just pick up incremental needs by customers and we'll see it play out. But I, I never say a number. Everybody wants to say, will there be you know, 2,642 in the future? I don't know. It's going to be yeah. a kind of behavior that, that happens. And and because uh, when I said, when there were 60, I became CEO, there's probably 5,800. And if I just said, we're going to be at 4,300 people who said, you're nuts. And we didn't know we were going to be there, but we knew we needed to have you know, less of the ones we had. And we ended up at 4,300. It was never, a, it's always a plan. It's not left to chance, but it's a couple years at a time. It's not, oh, there's some magic number at the other end. Right. Now that totally makes sense. But you, you mentioned something and I liked how you phrased this. You talked about high touch and high tech. And we've obviously seen some of the other large banks um, kind of moving down their digital transformation. B of A has actually done it, obviously. And we've seen kind of some of these others pop up, whether it's the PayPals or Squares. Um, you know, but how are you guys thinking about that digital transformation and in particular digital banking as it relates to your business? I mean, does it become an acquisition of one of these guys? Is it what you're building? Can you kind of talk about how you're thinking about that, especially with the wonderful Gen Z's on the phone and millennials that don't ever think they need a branch? Yeah, well, what's interesting is if you look at our new accounts, we open at a much higher percentage of the, po of the population in those categories today, you know, so we, we get then then is represented by the population, you know, so our, we're open a much higher share of the population. We have share of the pop, share of the total population. So we're over indexing uh, millennials and, and uh, the Gen Z's, et, et cetera. And so that we have a great uh, business, uh, the, uh, a great set of uh, electronic uh, digital capabilities, things like Zelle, which is the payments thing, you know, we're 30% of all the Zelle volume, I, I think round numbers, and we're driving that because that P2P payment and that, frankly, going back to John's question, lower in the use of cash. Uh, things like Erica, which is an artificial intelligence voice activated assistant. You can say, play, you know, you pay, you know, pay University of Miami tuition at pop up UM. It's and Alexa's and, sister, right? Erica's yeah. Alexa's sister. Yeah, it's, 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 <laughs> uh, well, it's, it's not very inventive. Bank of America, Erica, you can probably figure it out. But, uh, um, and it's, uh, that's got, I don't know, 16 million users or something like that, using it multiple times. It's, it just makes it easier to operate the digital platform because I can talk and that, you can literally sit down and pay you know, pay, you know, you know, pay my utility bill and it'll pop up the utility bill. Uh, how much you want to pay? $72, boom, and it goes. And so think about that easy interface. So, you know, those things are pretty avant-garde. We just did a thing called life plans, which is a financial planning capability. We thought we'd have a half million by year and we already have a million people using it today. And that's both a high touch and high tech because the financial, the FSA is a Merrill Edge teammates in the branch work with clients have done about 150 to 200,000. The other 800,000 have been clients doing it on their own. Mm -hmm. And that's like in three weeks. And so, yeah. you know, these things are massively adoptive. And so we don't need to do acquisitions. We need to keep studying the customer needs. We need to look at how other people are dressing and then we need to build the capabilities. But we, just to be clear, when you talk about digitization, you know, you, you, you are an equities business practitioner. If you think about where you were 10 years ago versus today, this is happening through the backbone of the company at the same time and through the operational structure of the company at the same time. And so Erica, we use to do build credit offering memorandums in a commercial bank that people can natural language process and could talk to it and build a COM. And it's yeah. not the retail Erica, but it's the same voice activated artificial intelligence, you know, transcriber that can pull information and play with it. And so it's pretty interesting, but to do that, you forget we had to build a natural language for banking. Because if you said what, you know, what's my balance to Google, you might get a, 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 an interest in a yoga studio. 
Hmm. And, and if you did that in our app, you'd probably say, what the heck? So we had to, we worked with Stanford and they built us a natural language about banking. So it could work. And then we have to have the artificial intelligence and you have to have 110 systems it touches. And then you have to have the connectivity. So it's, it's not easy to do, but it's, it, it, we're using it in other ways throughout. And it, it would be robotics, except in the service industry, we don't use that term. And that's what really it does. It basically does what a person could do for it. Wow, wow. That is just, that's incredible. And I think, I don't, I don't know how many folks really know and understand just how you guys are morphing. Um, but I'd be remiss, you brought up equities. And obviously uh, I have a little bit of an institutional background in the space. And, and I'll, I'll also kind of tie it a little bit to some of our, our students. And, and as you know, and we've seen people talk about the Robin Hood culture and, and folks really getting involved, which I think is a good thing in investments and in buying stocks. Um, and one thing that's obviously come back in full swing as of late has been equity capital markets, despite the pandemic. Right. And, and tech has done an incredible job for obvious reasons. How is Bank of America really adjusting to some of the latest trends in equity capital markets, specifically as it relates to, you know, whether it's direct listings or the infamous specs that everybody's heard all about? Is there anything that um, that concerns you? Where are you spending your time? How, how are you and your team thinking about um, equity capital markets and, and the way it looks today and how it's look, going to look going forward? So there's you know, two sides of that, the retail side, the institutional side, but our legacy company owned a thing called Quick and Riley, whose business model was to take, you know, Merrill, oddly enough, yeah. it was a bunch of people broke off from Merrill Lynch. You created a phone-based, you know, deep discounted brokerage model to take on the Merrill Lynch high commission model at the time. Then we had in our part platform companies like SureTrade and things like that, that were, you know, the online brokerage craze in the late nineties. And we went to zero, and then we folded that together and we went to zero dollar trades in 2006 or seven. So it's not like a new concept. Right. Um, and so we've always been about getting more people democratizing, investing, getting in, but always with a view that the customer had to, wanted to have a long term view. So our Merrill Edge platform, you know, is really about it is self-directed. You can trade on it. We have three hundred billion dollars of assets almost on it now. It's it's grown hundreds of thousands of customers over the last year. It's it's a tremendous platform. But embedded in that life plans I talked about, embedded in that uh, Maggie Merrill Edge Guided Investing where you just put the money in, it's an automated rebalancing every month you know, for a $5,000 minimum account for very low cost. And you can do individual securities. And so that capability. So we believe investors should be invested, but we believe they should be invested long-term and, and not speculating, but thinking about long-term. And that's how we gear the whole business. And then when you move to the wealth management business with Merrill and the private bank, it's like that. When you go to the institutional side, look, it's the same theory. It, you know, it, the idea of taking a tariff out of the system is just a constant <laughs> heat-seeking missile that goes on in, in, in capital markets. And so when something has a market price and there's deep liquid markets, people are going to try to take the commissions out. And there's two sides, the issuance commission, that's the direct listings and things like that, or the secondary trading commission, which is you know driving that down and, and, and things. And so these are relentless efforts that are going to go on. And yet at the end of the day, you know, some companies can direct list. The vast majority of them can't because they need the support to get through the IPO process. They need the support to build the investor base. And our team does, our equity capital markets team has had a great year doing that. Um, or in the debt side, the same thing. But is there a relentless push to lower and lower cost, tariffs, whatever, taxes, commissions, whatever word you want to use, depending on how you think about the business. We love the business, so we call them our well-earned fees. But um, well-earned fees and that's what i call it and i'm sticking to it <laughs> yeah, and, that, and that's what uh, that's what we drive but the, there'll always be a race to lower and lower and less and less and so what's you know what you have is a increase in volume that makes up for decline in rate and you hopefully that grows your revenue that is not a new concept on the retail side and it's not a new concept on the institutional side and our job is to stay ahead of it and keep manu remanufacturing the business and jimmy tomorrow there and and sufi and the team do a great job but they have to literally invest hundreds of millions of dollars a year to basically cannibalize themselves at all times. It's, it's a pretty unique thing, but it's been going on for a long time. What concerns you though, Brian? What, what, if, of all of that, what, what concerns you? Well, the, if you think about when we say what keeps us up at night, which is a proverbial question that you ask yourself, you know, right now is, you know, we're still in this pandemic and it's, it, you know, we, a banking system in a bank is going to reflect the economy because we transmit it you know, to, from consumers to businesses, businesses to consumers, and consumers to cap, uh, companies to capital markets. 
And so we worry about the economy. The good news is Candace Browning Platner team, which are the best research team in the business. So, you know, everything they see is we'll have a good strong number come out for the third quarter here in the next day or two. Um, the fourth quarter will be positive. Next year is up by four or five percent. So you're, you're seeing this recovery or back to about 90 odd percent of the level we were before the pandemic. But that's the number one issue. Now, the current crisis issue is if this thing goes on too long, does the unemployment become more permanent? The human issue around unemployment is a, is a tragedy that we need to help those people by giving unemployment benefits. But the issue from a pure economic is if this goes on for a long time, so we've got to worry about that. We worry about cyber risk. We worry about operational risk because we have all these people working from home. And you have to remember that's not as easy as if they're working with us in, the, in our buildings and with our protected systems. And, you know, so we worry about all that. We worry about, you know, international um, issues and trade and trade wars. And, but that's, uh, that's what we get paid to do as management is get up in the morning. And, and the way you beat that is what we call responsible growth. We have to balance it. All things in moderation. You know, you know, John may not teach us in his business school course, but that is a Roman proverb from 100. But that is the, the issue. If you lean too far and that doesn't work, you can't recover. So the idea of a bank is to keep balanced and, and make money in all these different ways. And so this year, you know, rates came down. Consumer didn't make as much money. The market's business made more money. It, next year, I guarantee you, consumers come and roaring back. It's, it's up to $2 billion a quarter the last quarter again. And so you know, you're just balancing your company and then driving it and, and trying to not lean in any direction. And that helps with all those risks and, and, and invest heavily in protecting your flank cyber risk and invest heavily in systems architecture and data uh, effectiveness and operational risk. Those are the real issues now. We've, the market and credit, you know, got it. Now we got to make sure the operational risk stays in control. Well, I'm going to ask one last thing before I turn it back over to John, because um, I would be remiss to not do this. Obviously, you saw the markets today, and, and everyone is concerned, at least from my perspective, first and foremost, about COVID um, and COVID's impact clearly on the economy, right? So you, you talked a little bit about the concerns. There's a human element. There's obviously how that impacts the, the economy overall. But as you think about and, and you talk to your friends, right? Um, what do you tell them as it relates to how you think that the global economy can actually recover? And, and what do you think can be done? And before I, before I do that, you, you mentioned, and I agree with you, obviously the Fed's doing everything they can. Companies are doing everything that they can. People are doing a lot, right? Of, of coming together around it. But, but what, what do you think right now needs to be done to get this economy, um, I'll call it back on track, but I'm, but I'd rather say better than it is today. Well, leave aside a lot of long-term implications embedded in that question: skills, training, population growth, immigration reform, all good things, infrastructure, all all important things. At dealing with a federal de deficit after we get done with this, the, the real near-term question is to get through the healthcare crisis. Mm -hmm. And so, until people. So we can go back and think about this in 9-11 context, which was after 9-11, people didn't fly. People thought, oh my God, airlines are out of business. Well, when they felt it was safe, they flew. So what's, what's gonna make us feel safe to go to a movie theater, eat inside at dinner, travel on a plane, go stay in a hotel, go on a business trip again? That's the question. And what we know would do is if everybody had a vaccine and this virus was behind us, and, and this is important, and we are prepared to deal with the next issue around a similar virus much more quickly mm -hmm. and have a recovery plan and a, re a plan in our company and in society at large. You know, we had a half million masks to start. We now have 40 million in inventory. I uh, believe me, if we hear noise of another virus, everybody at work that day is wearing masks, you know, period, end of story. We may be wrong that that's the best method, but why, why take the chance? If we'd have done that and as a society back then, it would have changed things. But that was not a, an agreed to strategy among the scientists and others, people didn't know. So, so we can build the resiliency and stuff. So we need to do both. We need to solve this que question near term, which is all about getting, getting to, in, in, between now and a vaccine, it's about learning how to operate and keeping the spread down, which is social distancing, masks and things like that. And it's about providing a bridge to the other side of the river for the piece of the economy that, that haven't been able to make it yet. Yeah. The unemployed, the small businesses, the restaurants, the uh, airlines, the cruise ships, the movie theaters, the you know, the, the industry, the states and cities, the nonprofit museums, the nonprofit performance venues, 
providing stim you know, continued support for them while you wait for the virus and then continue to focus heavily on the treatment regimens. The interesting thing is even though with more cases now, you're not getting as bad outcomes and the treatment regimens introduced early on seem to have a bigger impact as we've observed in our population of inmates. And so hitting people harder, faster, getting an identified testing, that's all we can do between now and the, and the vaccine. And then we gotta be ready for the logistics of the vaccine. If you do that, you'll feel safe to get on a plane and go to a restaurant and go to a movie theater. And then you'll restart that part of the economy that's lagging and that will complete the economic recovery. And then we'll be left back to the issues of population growth, immigration reform, trade, trade, uh, you know, trade agreements, uh, uh, global trade agreements, uh, uh, climate change and factoring that and then infrastructure investment. But we can't get to those issues until we get this virus under control because there is no alternative. If people, you know, France, Germany today, if that's what people have to do to slay, that, that's, that's, that's gonna always have an impact on the economy. Meanwhile, today, in the month of October, the Bank of America customer base has spent 9%, six or 8%, it, it, we'll see what ends, I think it'll be closer to nine, more money this October than they did last October. Mm -hmm. So the economy has already recovered to a lot of degree. The question is, can it stay here if we, have, if we can't keep hospitalizations and, and bad outcomes under control and keep the number of cases? That, that's the interesting debate. So I, I think it's a relatively straightforward question. What would make you feel safe again? And if we could get people to feel safe again, then we could do it. And we have to do it prior to a vaccine. And that means the techniques we have for treatment and masks, a lot of which we're doing a great job with, if you think about it, in the context of the freedom of movement relative to the infection rate, even though it's up. Right. And then lack of concentration and things. We have to be very careful. And a lot of the experts have talked about that. We listen to scientists, but yeah, you know, we're just, we're not getting people work sick and things like that. It's, it's what people are doing at home and that's what we need okay. to focus on. Absolutely. Courtney, thanks. Uh, thanks for your help. And uh, Brian, one, one of the things that I think uh, uh, Bank of America are very well known for is uh, being a great place to work and uh, your, your own personal commitment to diversity and inclusion, including uh, disability inclusion, uh, is well documented. Uh, we had the recent announcement of the $2 billion bond uh, to advance sustainability and equality by the bank. Uh, please speak to us about uh, why this is so important to you personally and uh, how are you going to measure the success of this kind of uh, initiative? Well, the, the program we announced, which off of our PL, for lack of a better term, there's a billion dollar program that Social Bond gives us money to do that and other things to help other clients do activities, um, which we issued and Courtney's firm was an underwriter with us on it and then participated in it. It was unique. So let me just sort two questions. I'll come back to us, but the reason why we do green bonds as a principal and the social bond and this social bond is we are driving, trying to create markets for other people to raise money to do good things. And as a, as a major issue of debt, we can show the way by issuing what the technical terms would be benchmark bonds. So now we've issued a benchmark social bond. So Courtney and her colleagues can go out and say, we just did this bond for Bank of America. You can do one too. It might be smaller, it may not be two billion, but it will help you raise the money at a very attractive rate because there's a great demand out there to work on these issues. So that, that's, the, that's aligning finance to help achieve these uh, goals. That's, that's something that we're working on a lot as companies and, and as investors and others. In terms of what Bank of America, it, there's an old colleague of yours from your prior school named Raj Chetty, and I, uh, you may know Raj's work, and a fellow named John Freeman from Brown, and they, they have done a lot of work around economic mobility, and it's been something our company has been concentrated on. As we looked in our communities, and it happened to be in that ranking of, of cities, Charlotte was 50 out of 50, and uh, or 49 out of 50, or something like that. And so the, the, it all kind of shocked it, because Charlotte is a very successful city. But when you find out the economic mobility uh, by race, and, and it, it was that low, you said, what happened? And so the government convened the workforce to work on it. But the business community always stepped up and said, wait a second, how can we help? What programs can we drive together? And make it drive. And so this has been on our mind for years. And then lo and behold, unfortunately and tragically, you have the George Floyd killing that starts a nationwide awareness around this. And so we've been working on a program in our company, and these horrible killings took place that we said we have to do something. And we basically had a three part program. One was to announce racism and diversity inclusion of our company and stand by that. The second was to do the billion dollar program to help in four categories health, housing, entrepreneurship and job skills and training uh, to, to spend a billion dollars to help the incomes most of the, the communities, low moderate income communities most affected by this virus. So you had a double 
issue going on. And then, and it was around economic mobility. And then the third was to create a courageous conversation platform with the Smithsonian. And so the billion dollars is about economic mobility. How can we create higher skill development among people to get them better jobs? And so, you know, how have we deployed it? We've, we've taken up 5% inv equity investment and 10 of the uh, MDIs, the Minority Depository Institution. We have, you know, $100 billion, million dollars deposits in them. We have 1.7 to the CDFIs. We are going to put 200 million of equity into companies in these markets. And Gene Schaefer in Miami will do it in Miami, and hopefully other CEOs will come with us. We're building job grant programs. We just announced one in Rhode Island uh, with uh, 250 jobs with the governor there off the CARES Act. But it's around skills. We go to the employers and say, "What skills do you need?" We go to the community college or let's say train to those the high school and train those skills. It's about massive skill development. You train those skills, we'll hire the people. We've done it in Charlotte with a bunch of different programs, and we've done it around the country. So we did that with 11 community colleges. And then for the four-year colleges, the HBCUs, we did a bunch of grants really around career development because those kids are college, going to be college graduates, the brightest anything. Their issue is not, you know, employment in terms of skilling. Their issue is can we get employers to get into those colleges and recruit and hire? And we hired, I think, you know, 10, 15 people out of the, uh, your, your school last year from undergraduate and uh, that many interns, and we'll do that every year. But maybe we weren't going enough to the HBCUs or maybe other employers weren't, so we're building them career development. So those are the kinds of programs we're working on it, but it all goes back to, we believe that everybody should have the chance to equal opportunity and be able to leverage on it. And then we believe that economic mobility is key to lower uh, just the, the issues around uh, racial progress and, 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 uh, and, and around what's Hispanic, African-American, Native American, et cetera. And then frankly, you gotta have a real conversation. And that was a Smithsonian platform. We have a platform, our company called Courageous Conversations, 80,000 teammates have done it since the George Floyd killing um, and the Breonna Taylor killing. And, and, and you know, those, those teammates, when it happened, came to me, we've had it going for five years and it's things like driving while black. It's very raw discussions. And on the disability you mentioned about being disabled and what to do and what not to do and how to do it and how, to, you know, just really straightforward, pragmatic. And so those discussions were going on and then this thing hit and we and the employees thousands of emails said you know i wish people could have the conversations i have at work out, outside in the community and we said i said okay that's simple i've worked with lonnie bunch for years he runs the smithsonian i've been on the board of the african-american history museum of history and culture at the smithsonian for a decade now plus 12 years i think it is now and and you know i said to lonnie create a platform and we'll be an anchor grant it's your platform but we're going to help you get started to have that conversation and i'm, I'm sure john on the at, at the university, you've been having a lot of these conversations with the student body and with the various groups. And we got to have conversations so people understand, not that that's going to solve the problems, but without that, at least starting that understanding, we're never going to get people to really understand the difference of what's gone on and what people are really worried about. And that's, you know, so that's the pieces of it. So it's our commitment as a company. Um, we believe a teammate has to, the, the way we define inclusion in our company is you have to be able to bring yourself to work and be a successful, no matter where you came from, no matter what your background was, but no matter what your education was. When we defined it 15 years ago, you know, people, the person said, I don't want to have to leave myself at the door and pick it up on the way home. And we said, you know what, that's the definition to use. And we've been measuring that every year, the progression on this idea that I can bring my whole self to work and be successful. That's such a simple statement of what inclusiveness means. Diversity is representation statistics, but and we strive to get that right. We just had the highest scores we've ever had in the company this last employer survey. So we've been measuring pretty accurately for 12 years, 15 years. As you say, conversations, it all begins by talking. Well, it, people, you know, it's, it's interesting. I'm on the board of, you know, my alma mater and, you know, you see the angst around the BDS and the, those issues. You see the African-American uh, uh, a teammate, uh, colleagues in the university and their feeling of unsafe and privileged and all of that. It's just, but the conversations I understand it are critically important, I agree. And then you can start to work on solutions. The yeah. billion dollar program is about solutions at the community level, jobs and, and education help, you know, read by third grade, pre-K, uh, develop, we have a training program, a bunch of us sponsored in, in Rhode Island for principals. You know, we, these are all tactics, of STEM education and middle school. Uh, the C uh, uh, technical education program, but it's all companies sitting together and saying, how do we help bring the business system to education? They educate kids. We will 
help them with what they need. And, and it's very different. And the team's done a great job. And we're trying to export a lot of that discipline to all our markets, including Miami with uh, Gene. Okay. Um, we've got a couple of uh, questions from uh, the audience. Uh, uh, I'm going to try and be succinct here because we're a little bit short on time. And uh, many of the questions have, I think, been touched on in your answers so far. Uh, but one questioner asks about how do you manage your own work-life balance? <laughs> well, that's the old do as I say, not as I do problem. But <laughs> I, when people ask me, you know, what did you learn about, you know, I, I'd been a, see, a, a business person, run a division, you know, all this stuff for years. But when you become the CEO, you know, the demands on your travel, demands on your your energy are higher. So you have to stay in shape and you have to have a good family or a good significant other or good people. And I have a wonderful wife and Sue and my kids. You have to have people you can depend on who frankly treat you like they've always treated you. Ignore the fact you are who you are. Don't really need it. They need you to be a good father, a good friend, a husband and stuff like that, but they don't need anything from you. And, and they'll be honest with you at all times. And those are important things. So you have to have a family. And, and, and I always said, you have to, you have to, you don't have to be, you know, Charles Atlas, but you have to stay in shape because at the end of the day, the physical demands are high and you have to eat well and exercise. You know, these are like motherhood and apple pie answers. But mm -hmm. when you start traveling five days a week and, you know, and you're not, you can feel it pretty quickly. And so, you know, I think so that's how you maintain it. I maintain it by reading, you know, spy novels and stuff to get my mind off work. You learn stuff from them, but you're, you know, I try to do something that is not about work and enjoy exercise and enjoy going out to eat and try to get away from it. But you know, at the end of the day, you know, you're, when you run a company as big as Bank of America with all the issues Courtney and I touched on earlier, you are preoccupied a lot. And the key is to, is to figure out how to clear your mind. Um, what does the corporate headquarters of the future look like? You know, embedded in that is this question of, you know, is it work from home? We're a work in the office company. Uh, we already had 20,000 work from home people in the company. So it's not something we didn't have before. You will have flexibility that may open up avenues for people that um, to, to move part of the week and stuff, but that'll all play out. But I think the corporate headquarters of the future actually looks a little bit like we have. We have senior executives in Boston, New York, Charlotte, Atlanta, San Francisco, London, uh, it, that are all on my direct management team. And mm -hmm. I may probably miss in some places, but, and so think about, you know, the connectivity. So this, this kind of work is how we connect it. Once a month, we are together physically. All the other meetings were conducted you know, electronically and uh, by telepresence and things like that, uh, pre-Zoom day, so to speak. And you know, <laughs> I think it's, it's gonna be like that. It's gonna be a bunch of people moving at all times, a bunch of people with different skill sets. Um, and, but I think in the end of the day, to get the culture, especially in the business we're in, to have that culture, to have the young people learn at flight speed as opposed to, uh, walking speed, they need mm -hmm. to be together. And, and you can see, think about the kids that came out of your college that we employed in 19, you know, and think about today, they're 18 months in or something like that, you know, maybe 15, 16. They, they've only been in the office, you know, half that time. The kids we just tired this year have never been in the office. They got to meet their boss. They got to meet each other. They got to learn from each other. They got to have that hallway conversation. So there'll be a healthy balance here, um, but it will be, it will, it'll be some amalgamation, but I think people are answering this question in the middle of a crisis where people's reactions to travel and, and commuting are one thing. I think that will change it, right. and I, it'll swing back. And by the way, we have a lot of people saying, please let, get me back to work as fast <laughs> as possible. So everybody will have a different story. If they have kids at home or a parent, that's a little different. If they don't, you know, they're ready to come back. If, so we'll see, but it's, we got to get the feeling of safety and then we'll, then we'll have an honest debate about what the corporate headquarters looks like in the future after people have a choice. Right now, there's really no choice. Uh, what do you say to uh, young people who've recently graduated from college who uh, um, are facing a, a pretty dismal uh, job uh, prospect uh, situation at the moment? Well, you know, I, one of the things for our company is we hired all the, we gave all the interns last year. We tried to do the best. We gave a full intern experience eight or nine weeks instead of four. Uh, mm -hmm. We paid them, you know, et cetera. We, I think it, it, we gave across the board offers for them to come back and, you know, so I think the issue right now is we're trying to do our best to live up to hiring all those kids and getting them in because we need the talent. I mean, in this diverse town, it's top talent and we are a people company. So we have, you know, really talented teammates, buildings and computers, and that's what we have. So we need them all in here. I'd say if I were 
a kid that didn't have a job and I'm looking, you know, or I'm, I'm you know, and I'm graduating in the spring and it's tough, you know, take a job and start to learn something, get in the flow and it'll take you somewhere else. And I think John, you or Courtney or I, I, you know, I knew I wanted to be a lawyer. So I went to law school. So that kind of laid me in, but I took the job that I, you know, that I got out of law school. I didn't hold out for the perfect job. I didn't, you know, sit on a bench for three months saying, if I can't work in that city, I don't want to work. I took a job and then, you know, worked at it. And then that part, you know, far laid into a whole bunch of things. And so I think my basic advice is get going on something and then move that to the next thing. Because if you're sitting idle and stuff, it'll, it'll drive you crazy. So just get working. And that's, you know, we've hired a lot of kids to help us in ways they probably, they went to work on PPP at home in May. You know, we said, you want to start early. They probably never thought they were going to do that. But by doing that, they learned so much more about what was going on in the company that now they're way ahead. And that, so I think it's just get going. Be curious and get going. What, what are the three most important uh, qualities of a successful corporate leader? And do you think there's a leadership deficit in America at the moment? I think the most important quality is to think outside in. And because everybody around you is thinking inside you know, they're a team and everything. And so you have to sit there and start with a customer and come in. And I know that sounds simple and trivial, but it takes extreme discipline. You start with a customer and you start with a teammate that's going to work with the customer. And if they, if you can't, if somebody has an idea and they can't explain to you how the person who's actually going to do it can do it, it's a bad idea, even if it's a good idea. And so you have to start because that's where it happens. It doesn't happen in the Layers. There's eight levels in our company, and there's seven levels between me and the person doing the actual task in a given unit. It, 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 that not, that's not where the work gets done, and the customer interface is, and the customer understanding is, and the customer questions are going to be. So one is think out in, it, it, and you know, second is have a set of principles and repeat them. You know, so this responsible growth definition we have, uh, principles we have. You got to grow no excuses. Got to do it on a customer focused basis. Got to do it with the right risk. Got to do it on a sustainable basis. Yeah. You know, I've probably given the what we call our placemat literally tens, you know, thousands and maybe 10,000 times. I don't know, but a lot over the last 10 years. And you'd say, don't people remember it? They, they don't. There's with turnover, there's 10% more people there that never heard it before. And, but to keep the company moving on principles, you got to repeat yourself. So think out in, be ready to repeat yourself. And you have to be a sponge, especially in times like this. You just have to take the, the emotion of the company and absorb it. And, you know, I learned a lot about that, having several thousand employees right around the World Trade Center and going into New York and watching the plane go through. I was driving to the World Trade Center on the second plane went through. I went, worked with a team. We got open for business and it was just, but you realize the last thing they need you to do is to do anything but just listen and be a sponge and pull that off of them. And then, and then after you do that, then you can figure out what they need to get back to what they're gonna do. And I think this, this crisis has some of those elements and I think my leadership team, all agrees that and that's why we did some of the things we did right off the bat from the employee side, which, which served us well in the end. It, 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 it saved people's lives. It did the right thing. And, and we are, and it was good decisions. It cost us money, cost us productivity, all those things, but you had to be a sponge and listen to what the employees need. And then over time, you can get to the other side of what you need to do, but you have to be a sponge. I, th I think that's a great set of insights on which to end our conversation, uh, Brian. I uh, want to thank Courtney for, uh, being uh, part of the uh, uh, part of the evening, um, we yeah. value our alumni so highly here. And uh, Brian mentioned uh, Gene Schaefer by name. I want to underscore uh, the friendship that uh, we at the University of Miami have with uh, Gene and his team. And uh, really, once again, uh, Brian, on behalf of uh, all of our uh, trustees and alumni, students and faculty and staff on the call this evening. Uh, Thank you for everything you are doing, and uh, thank you for everything you're doing for the University of Miami. Oh, thank you, John. Thank you, Courtney, and uh, thank you. stay safe. You thank as well. You. Stay safe. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody, and uh, good night from Miami.